there are big things happening in a teeny tiny world. And that would be the world of nanotechnology, where scientists and engineers are working with materials that are a billionth of a meter in size. Last month, people were getting all excited about the billion dollar lottery. How about the billionth of a dollar lottery? Mm, not so exciting. But the world of nanotechnology is very exciting. Some people believe that space is the final frontier, but I think the final frontier is right here on this planet, right in front of us. What? You say you can't see anything in front of you? Of course you can't. Didn't I say a billionth of a meter? How small is that? For you engineers out there, that would be 10 to the minus 9 small. For the rest of us lay people, let me give you a few examples. The average human hair is approximately 75 microns in diameter. That would be 75,000 nanometers. So in the nano world, your hair is pretty fat. If your little fingernail was a nanometer wide, then your little finger would be about the size of the state of Delaware. If a tennis ball was a nanometer in diameter, then an actual tennis ball would be about the size of the planet. Are you starting to get the idea? We are talking about minuscule particles so small they cannot be seen with the naked eye because they're smaller than the wavelength of visible light. It wasn't until the invention of the scanning tunneling microscope in 1981 when scientists were able to visualize individual atoms and atomic bonds that nanotechnology took off. These are some images of different types of nanomaterials as seen with the scanning tunneling microscope. Nanotechnology was first hypothesized about in 1959 as a futuristic process in which scientists could manipulate and control atoms and molecules. The term nanotechnology was coined in 1974, but again, it wasn't until 1981 that research and development in nanotechnology began to flourish. So it's been with us for a little over 30 years now. I became familiar with nanotechnology just three years ago when I was doing research on a paper for a class. I was investigating how workers were being impacted by and protected from nanomaterials in the workplace. Nano comes from the Greek word for dwarf, and nanotechnology is the ability to observe, measure, manipulate, and manufacture at the nano level. It is used in fields of science as diverse as molecular biology, organic chemistry, microfabrication, surface science, and semiconductor physics, to name just a few. It's being used in medicine and food manufacturing. Nanotechnology is what has brought us such great advances in electronics and computers. Nanomaterials are stronger and lighter than their macro counterparts. They're being used to make hockey sticks and tennis rackets. One day we may see them being used to build airplane fuselages or even bridges. You will find nanoscaled ingredients in clothing, cleaning products, cosmetics, paint, and sunblock. It's being used in food to help whiten it, make it taste better, add more nutrients. It's being used in food packaging to help preserve it by killing bacteria that may cause spoilage. We're seeing it being used in ink to help prevent counterfeiting and cancer medications are being nano-encapsulated to help target tumors at the cellular level. Take a look at this demonstration. You can see the difference. Can you imagine 
clothes that we don't have to wash or a bathroom you don't have to clean, personally, I'm waiting for the self-cleaning cat litter box. <laughs> but all joking aside, it is because of nanotechnology that we are able to have a multitude of transistor networks in a space smaller than a pinhead. Nanotechnology is being used to purify water. It's being used in agriculture and food production to prevent disease in plants by using nanocides. It has been used to convert food waste into energy. Over 1,800 consumer products have been identified that may contain nanomaterials. Needless to say, there's a lot of research going on out there into different uses of nanomaterials. Countries and companies are spending a lot of money. Since 2001, the National Nanotechnology Initiative here in the United States has invested over $20.5 billion into nano research. That's a lot of zeros and that doesn't include the $1.5 billion that has been budgeted for fiscal year 2016. One of the things that gives nanomaterials their wondrous properties is its surface to volume ratio. As things get smaller, this ratio gets bigger. It is one of the things that causes nanomaterials it causes nanomaterials properties to behave differently than they do at the macro level. For instance, if we take a sugar cube and break it up to dissolve it in a liquid, we have increased its surface to volume ratio immensely because you're going from six big sides to thousands of teeny tiny sides. And this is what helps it to dissolve more quickly. Other physical properties that we see change at the nano level are hardness, crystalline structure, magnetism, explosiveness, heat, and electrical conductivity. With any new technology, there's bound to be concerns, fears, and even doomsday scenarios. When electricity was first being installed in homes, people didn't want to turn it on because they were afraid they would be electrocuted or that the electricity would leak out. Some cultures believed that the camera would steal your soul. We all know that robots are going to take over the world and that your home computer and TV are just there to spy on you. Oh, and don't forget your cell phone. It's merely a GPS tracking device so that the government knows where you're at. <laughs> Some of these fears are not unfounded. The government, its regulatory agencies, and industry do not have a very good track record when it comes to protecting the environment, consumers, or workers. Just take a look at Three Mile Island, thalidomide, or the current Flint, Michigan water debacle if you need more proof. Unlike Thomas Edison, I am not here to electrocute an elephant in regards to nanotechnology. When I first got the email about the TED Talk, I deleted it. But what got me thinking was the tagline, here there be monsters. And as you have seen and will see, this means different things to different people. But the best way to fight the monsters is to be informed, know the facts, and don't accept things blindly. As with anything new, there's bound to be unforeseen consequences. Marie Curie, who worked with radioactive materials in the late 1800s, early 1900s, did not die a healthy person. I would like to bring about an awareness, not only for the consumer, but for the engineer and scientist as well. Nanotechnology is a wide open field with lots of research and development going on and the money to back it up. But I believe there are three main areas of concern. We need to be looking at protecting the environment, protecting consumers, 
and protecting the workers who are coming in contact with these types of materials. There is no doubt that there are potential health and safety hazards related to exposure to nanomaterials. Aquatic studies are showing accumulation of nanomaterials in the livers of fish. The offspring of zebrafish who have been exposed to nanomaterials are being born blind. Soil samples that have been taken near nanotechnology facilities are showing a higher than normal concentration of nanomaterials. Workers who have been exposed are exhibiting mesothelioma type symptoms. Animal feeding studies that have been done are showing nanomaterials in all the major organs, including the brain, heart, liver, kidneys, spleen, and bone marrow. Placental transfer and fetal uptake has also been seen. There are three main ways that nanomaterials can enter the body. Through the skin, ingestion, and inhalation, with inhalation being the biggest area of concern among workers. In most workplaces, employees have access to safety data sheets. These sheets will give them information about materials that they will handle or may come in contact with during the course of their job. Safety data sheets provide them information such as chemical composition, material handling and storage, first aid, and personal protective equipment that can be used when handling different types of materials. These are some examples of personal protective equipment that is recommended when handling nanomaterials. The N100 respiratory mask is good for blocking particles that are bigger than 100 microns, which is equivalent to 100,000 nanometers. The HEPA filters are better, blocking particles bigger than 0.3 microns, which is equivalent to 300 nanometers. Eyewear, protective eyewear and face shields can also be used, and in some instances, Protective clothing is required when handling nanomaterials. Gloves are also highly recommended. But is this enough? Only time and some good research studies will tell. Again, I am not here to demonize nanotechnology, but to help you become more informed citizens. Do not be afraid when it comes to asking questions about your health and well-being. People have the right to know what they're eating, what they're wearing, what they're putting on their skin. What is the best way to protect people from nanomaterials? Product labeling is most likely the best avenue. I'm an advocate of labeling and believe that people have the right to know if a product that they're using may or may not be good for them. It's a brave new world, technology is all around us and we can't get away from it, but again, we have the right to know. Thank you.